Welcome to our program on the Ignatian Exercises for Seekers with Father Roger Haight. Thank you for coming. My name is Melinda Brown Donovan, uh, and I'm the Associate Director for Continuing Education for the School of Theology and Ministry. It's part of the mission of the School of Theology and Ministry to offer learning opportunities that foster Christian faith. And we do it both on campus with lectures like this one, as well as online with non-credit online enrichment courses through C21 online. If you haven't seen our fall calendar yet, it looks like this, and you can get copies out here on the registration table. We offer at least one presentation every week between now and the middle of November, and then we'll start again around the 1st of February with various lectures, seminars, and workshops. In particular, I'd like to invite you to consider coming to our annual Ministry Renewal Day, which is on Friday, November 12th, and this year it is featuring Thomas Groom and Sister Meg Guider, who are both members of the STM faculty. They will be speaking on Reclaiming Catholicism, Treasures, treasures Old and New. In addition, on November 16th, we're offering a panel discussion with Sean Copeland, Dominic Doyle, and Richard Lenon on the topic, Hope, the Church's Prophetic Challenge. And our Carmelite series continues on Saturday, November 6th, and then again on December 4th. I'd also like to offer a word of thanks to our co-sponsor, the Church in the 21st Century Center, who have very generously supported this lecture, and they've also arranged for videotaping of this event. It will be available on the Church 21 Center web, um, website as streaming video within about two weeks. Now it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Francine Cardman, who will introduce our speaker. Dr. Cardman is on the STM faculty as Associate Professor of Historical Theology and Church History. Good evening. It's my pleasure tonight to welcome it's, I'm stumbling already. I've tried, tried to decide, do I call him Father Roger Haight, Dr. Roger Haight, Professor Roger Haight, Roger Haight, um, of the Society of Jesus to the School of Theology and Ministry and back once again to the Boston area. Roger has taught at Jesuit schools of theology all over the world, actually, um, in Manila, in Chicago, in Toronto, and in Cambridge with Western Jesuit School of Theology for 14 years. Um, and he has taught also occasionally at Hakima School of Theology in Nairobi. He has been most recently a visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary in New York and is currently a scholar in residence there. Roger is the author of eight books and of articles and essays too numerous to count. Throughout these writings, Roger has followed, I think, one thread um, in its many um, different uh, variations and guises uh, and, and uh, manifestations. And that thread is taking seriously the historicity of the human person and consequently the historicity of the human encounter with God especially as this encounter is mediated through Christian faith and practice. Whether exploring the language and experience of grace, the alternative vision of liberation theology, the dynamics of theology, um, the intricacies of Christology uh, and of ecclesiology, Roger has consistently followed this thread that joins our human existence with what we as Christians recognize as the saving acts of God in history. At Union Theological Seminary, Roger surprisingly found himself giving 19th annotation retreats to the mainly Protestant students studying there. Tonight, we will be the beneficiaries of that surprising experience, as well as of Roger's uh, ongoing studies in um, spirituality broadly conceived. Uh, as he talks with us about Ignatian Exercises for Seekers. Please join me in welcoming tonight 
uh, a friend and colleague and a teacher to so many of us, Roger Haight. What a nice introduction, isn't it? Uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here. I've never been lectured in this, this room because I, all the time I was at Weston, we were, of course, in Cambridge. Uh, so it's good to uh, try out the new building, so to speak. Let me start right away into the presentation I want to give. I, I, I want to say at the outset, this, this is a little bit experimental on my part. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with this. Uh, and so this is a test run and see what people think. Uh, so I'm very interested in the Q&A and how people uh, perceive what I'm up to here. So let me begin where Francine left off. In my second year at Union Theological Seminary 2005, in New York, I was asked to participate in a resource team that attended to the spiritual formation of the community, particularly the students. Uh, they'd lost a chaplain and the president didn't want to hire another one. As part of that program, I offered the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola to 35 students over a period of eight weeks in the spring of 2007. And then two years later to another 25 students. I'll do this again in the spring. Now Union is a distinctive place. I would describe it as a liberal Protestant interdenominational seminary that has a strong ethos of social engagement but is centrist by and large in doctrinal and theological uh, issues. Is the, is the sound good here? Is that, is that all right? Yeah. Its student body is very pluralistic with people from all denominations. It includes Unitarians who do not self-define as Christian, many of whom, many of the students have no church affiliation, and people who belong to other religions, a few Jews, a few Buddhists, and so on. So this describes broadly the people who engaged in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola and appreciated them. On the basis of that experience, I have taken up a project of interpreting the spiritual exercises for a very broad audience, not excluding Catholics, but more pointedly addressed to Protestants and people outside Christianity, perhaps members of other religions, perhaps with no religious affiliation at all, but who are looking for spiritual depth. In the first two sections of this presentation, I'll speak about the rationale for this project, including some problems uh, of the problems that it entails. And in the third, I'll in illustrate some of the language that I've adopted by reading some reflections that I've composed on Ignatius's uh, principle and foundation, uh, the keynote uh, meditation, the call of the king, and finally the contemplation to a divi uh, attain divine love. Now I have pretty much had to presume with this audience that people are more or less familiar with the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola to another audience I'd probably introduce Ignatius and how he wrote these exercises and how they developed and so on, what they are, their structure and so on. But I'm presupposing that, but I do have the text of those three meditations for you to, to uh, look at. So I begin, as you see on the outline there, what is a seeker? Who are they? I have to confess that I do not exactly know uh, who is included in this category. Um, the, term's extremely, the term is extremely broad and inclusive, but it should not be used to refer to just everyone. And this forces me to provide at least some sort of vague description of who I'm referring to. 
it, it, the following characteristic then helps to apply, or to supply rather, some, some degree of focus, at least the, the people who are in my imagination when I'm, when I'm working this out, uh, vague though it be. Seekers are those who do not quite feel settled in any definite faith commitment. They live on the edge of any creed, and they do not fully endorse any religion. And they have no lock on reality, and certainly no master narrative that excludes other people. And they want, but they want more coherence in their vision of things, more direction in their lives, and they're looking for more comprehensive meaning. Comprehensive, then, suggests width and depth, like a horizon within which discrete elements can be measured by being located in that horizon within a larger perspective that provides distance so that you can compare and situate and know where things are, relatively speaking, to each other. Certainly, some, some things must be more important than other things in our world, in our lives. The reference for the term seeker, then, has to do with the large questions of meaning and purpose in existence itself. Seekers live in this context. They're not content with the answers that, to these questions that have been proffered them thus far, and they're looking for symbols that can give them some order and deeper meaning in their lives. Is it good to be a seeker? The description given can be construed as something positive in contrast to those people who have all the answers, certainly. What is the valuation implied in the category seeker? Things begin to get tricky at this point. Is it good to be an agnostic? Much depends on the context and the premises of the question. For the believer, the religious believer, the faithful, agnosticism spells something like a loss of faith. But in a secular context, in which everybody else lives, it's simply a confession of ignorance. So too with the notion of a seeker. It admits shades of meaning within, even within a religious context, it seems to me. A soft religious meaning of being a seeker would refer to religious desires tested by the dark glass through which we see things now, not making it part of every day, <coughs> making it part of every day's personal existence in, in a way. In other words, there's a seeker in all of us. A sharper meaning of being a seeker may refer to a constant, troublesome nagging, like the deep need of the, of the hungry for food, which could border on a temptation to despair, because there's all sorts of degrees of that. Or it may be both together. What has to be preserved with the term seeker across its many nuances consists in a latent impatience and lack of satisfaction with what has been provided up till now, and proportionately an equal desire for some kind of coherence in their lives. Another question has to do with the depth and the prevalence of the uprootedness associated with being a seeker. I would have to defer to the sociologists of religion uh, to answer this question across the different segments of Western societies. But I can say this, I can say that this effort to address the seeker as well as those who self-identify as Christian has been stimulated by the undocumented premise that this condition is deep and widespread. It's latent in the cliché of being spiritual but not religious. 
Moreover, given the growing lack of interest in traditional religion in the West, becoming a seeker is rapidly becoming the statistically normative condition of ordinary believers if they are not downright apathetic, if they're still interested. One way to approach this situation, a way that is not polemical but purely constructive, consists in addressing the generic seeker, those who are either secular or those who are schooled in some religious faith but are not moved by the systems that they, as they stand and are looking for some depth of meaning in a language that makes sense to them. How does Christianity respond to the basic, basic questions that lie <clears throat> at the foundation of spirituality? Is human existence meaningful? And from whence does this meaning come? Where can it be found and experienced? Ignatius's spiritual exercises address these questions on an existential and practical level. And for the seeker, not much more is demanded than that. Can the exercises be offered to seekers? Second part. The term seeker, although it may include committed Christians, primarily applies to those with no explicitly developed religious faith. This raises the question of whether the spiritual exercises can be offered to people with no religious belonging. I know that they can, but theoretically can they, so to speak. Uh, so let me respond br briefly to this uh, clarifying question by defining what I mean by spirituality, responding therefore positively to the question, and indicating why the project, problem, the project that I'm uh, embarking upon is still quite problematic. First of all, the conception of spirituality operative in this project opens up some new possibilities. I understand sp spirituality to refer primarily to the way people live their lives with special reference to an ultimate horizon or a horizon of ultimacy which guides their behavior. In this view of things, everyone has a spirituality. And this rescues the term from some esoteric sphere without, trying, without tying it exclusively to, religious, uh, to the religious sphere or to religious, formerly religious practices. Spirituality may or may not be a religious spirituality. But spirit, spirituality consists much more than simply the conscious and the unconscious flow of activity. It's not just lifestyle. It includes the set of ultimate values that constitute a, a horizon that, that, that contains the signals by which one measures the importance of things and guides one's decisions. The way one leads one's life ultimately defines one's spiritual identity. The most secular of speak seekers have spirit a spirituality, albeit somewhat unstable and by definition looking for some kind of formulation and definition. Second, the spiritual exercises can be addressed to one without religious faith because of the way that Ignatius set them up. The substance of the exercises consists in imaginatively entering in to the gospel stories about Jesus of Nazareth. That's their substance. That's the bottom line. There is no doubt that Ignatius had a high Christology. He can, he can address at times Jesus as uh, the divine majesty. 
but he insists in presenting the gospel stories in a way that actually highlights Jesus' as being a human being and thus able to be followed. This humanity of Jesus is the key to his communicability. It's the key to his universal relevance. It's the reason why any human being can turn to him. Everyone can appreciate Jesus insofar as he is a human being and thus like them. Third, however, one should notice that a consistent appeal to Jesus' human life and ministry does create some tension with a Christian sensibility for what Christians, for what uh, for what Christian doctrine proclaims about his person and his relationship with God. This tension lies beneath the surface of the language that I will employ in reflecting on Ignatius' um, exercises, his meditations, and it is quite acute, actually. The problem consists in finding a language that accommodates two very different audiences. Those used to thinking of Jesus as divine and those approaching him as a fellow human traveler. I should add as an aside that this is not a theological problem because the doctrine of Chalcedon precisely preserves the integrity of Jesus' being a human being exactly like us. The problem is rhetorical, if I can say it. It's intrinsic to the enterprise of finding the right language of how to talk about Jesus in a setting with these two audiences. It can only be resolved, it seems to me, with patience from each side of the issue. Tolerance on the part of Christians who expect to hear more about Jesus' divinity and tolerance on the part of secular seekers who may hear too much of it. So with these introductory, introductory remarks, I want now to offer examples of three reflections on meditations. They're not quite meditations, they're too abstract to be uh, meditations, but they're reflections about meditations, and then they could very well be useful to people who will then bring them to, 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 to prayer or for directors. Some will be familiar with these meditations, uh, some not, so I've distributed the text so that uh, for those who are unfamiliar with them. Uh, the text is just there, I'm not going to refer to it, but in general, the, they are the topic of what I'm talking about. Uh, you say, you s the, the, I'm not, I'm not gonna read them or repeat them, they're being interpreted into the 21st century, of course, and for an audience. So some examples of attempts to address seekers. I've chosen three meditations from Ignatius' spiritual exercises. One could make a case that these three together go a long way towards defining the internal logic of the whole program of the exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius called them principle and foundation, the call of the king, and contemplation to attain love. I've renamed them a bit to uh, indicate more directly what I'm offering, that I'm offering an improvisation on them in a new key. The reflections that I offer here are not quite meditations, as I indicated, that they would, they would more accurately be called considerations or reflections or analyses or something like that. Um, I'm not altogether pleased with that, but halfway through composing these, I said, well, here I am. What can I do? You know? <laughs> like Martin Luther, I can do not, no otherwise. I mean, this is what I do for a living. Uh, somebody else could be much more rhetorical, rhetorically concrete and apply 
more readily to the emotions and the effect, affective side as Ignatius himself does. Uh, but as I said. So they're considerations and reflections, but notice that they presuppose a context that has been set up by what Ignatius Loyola calls preludes to a meditation or preludes to a contemplation. Uh, these are taking a minute before entering into these considerations or reflections or meditations and being mindful of what you're doing. Secondly, of uh, recreating the subject matter in your imagination. Thirdly, asking God uh, for uh, what you want to get out of spending this time. Um, now you wouldn't ask a seeker to ask God. Uh, this is a part of the problem. Uh, but you can adapt those uh, preludes. But what I just want to say here is those preludes are presupposed here. Uh, the, 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 these reflections are unfolding within the context of a prayerful uh, reader or uh, listener. So the reflections that follow are objective, somewhat analytical, abstract, but they are meant to, res to represent the kind of thinking that could go on within a reverent search for an ultimate horizon for one's spirituality, whether or not one was a believer of, in God. So with that, I'll proceed with the first consideration, seeking principles and a foundation. Ignatius had one. Ignatius Loyola possessed what many reflective people in our world today do not a first principle and a foundation upon which he could rebuild his life after his conversion. Even religious people today may not enjoy this privilege. But this consideration which he refined into a preface for his uh, exercises opens up salutary questions with which one might begin. Who am I? Why am I here? Does some larger purpose underlie being itself and human existence within it? Human existence is freedom. When human beings are considered in relationship to other forms of life, they stand out on the basis of their freedom. While continuity streams through evolutionary creation and all forms of life, freedom differentiates the human. A fundam fundamental um impulse for life animates all forms of living creatures. They strive to continue living, to grow, and to flourish. In an analogous manner, the human species has a drive for the flourishing of its freedom. This can be experienced by each person, even though the conceptions of what exactly constitutes freedom may be wildly different. The human freedom experienced by each person within the species carries a tension between a sense of one's own individuality and being part of a community and society. Wide variations exist among, along an axis between feeling autonomous and feeling responsible to a group. But neither dimension can be reasonably neglected. The narrative character of life reinforces a person's individuality. Human beings live in time and become gradually better defined as individuals by their own stories. Yet they are always accompanied by others and no one exists independently of the influence of a community. If principles and a foundation for human existence are to be found, they will have to be such that they are both common 
and at the same time directly bear relevance to each unique individual person. Ignatius uses language of human sovereignty over the world of nature and the things of this world. We live today with fuller recognition of several things not available to the 16th century, how deeply human existence is immersed in nature and produces or reproduces in itself the inorganic and organic strata of evolution, how human existence itself depends on an, an integrated relationship with nature, how collective human freedom can threaten its own existence by inflicting deep damage on the planet. We have learned that the things of this world are not only created for human beings, but also human beings are created to tend and care for other things on the face of the earth. This case dramatically illustrates on a broad evolutionary scale with immediate practical consequences, the organic tensive character of human freedom's responsibility. We cannot escape responsibility. John Calvin captured this in his principle of stewardship. The things of this world, he wrote, were so given to us by the kindness of God and so destined for our benefit that they are, as it were, entrusted to us, and we must one day render account of them. What nurtures freedom in self and others is good. When Ignatius distinguished between ends and means, he provides a lead for thinking about principles and a foundation. It seems to be useful to distinguish between ends and means so that one has some sense of an internal order of things. If the distinctive mark of human existence is its freedom and it contains an inner dynamism for flourishing, then the distinction between ends and means establishes a way of speaking about some order within human existence without an appeal to an ideology imposed from outside, but from within. Those things which serve as me means to foster human freedom appear as good, and those things which suppress human freedom are evil. If something inherently suppresses human freedom, which defines a fundamental mark of human identity, it can be judged negatively as an evil. This is hardly the end of the discussion because there, are, there may be little agreement about what exactly constitutes human freedom. But a recognition of the possibility of talking about principles and a foundation represents ground gained for the seeker. Freedom is most itself when not weighed down with attachments. Ignatius lays down another basic principle about human freedom when he talks about indifference and attachments. The word attachments accurately describes little addictions, things upon which we develop dependencies. We pick up a thing and it sticks to our hands and we can't shake it off. Ignatius uses the term indifference in a positive, not a negative way. Freedom can be cool or it can be passionate, but in either case, it remains sovereign over itself. True freedom, then, is light. It's not weighed down by attachments. Paradoxically, it grows in strength with its lightness, because more within the control of a reflective spiritual uh, autonomy. And freedom's strength, when it is responsible, constitutes its flourishing. 
To find purpose and meaning in existence, one has to choose. The quest for and the exercise of true freedom in our world today encounters considerably more obstacles than it did in the 16th century Europe. Many of these stems from the, stem from the pervasive pluralism that marks our contemporary life. It's dazzling and it's confusing. For example, <clears throat> Pascal formulated his wager in a relatively homogeneous Christian world. The competition from Jews and Muslims was suppressed. He virtually framed the wager between two options as with a flip of the coin. <clears throat> On the one side, the option against God was the status quo, which he looked upon as misery in this world and nothing thereafter. On the other side was a meaningful life in this world and eternal happiness in the next. What's not to choose? Compare the two chances, he wrote. If you win, you win everything. If you lose, you lose nothing. Don't hesitate then. Make a bet that God exists. In the context and with these options, the choice seems relatively easy compared with our secularized and religiously pluralistic world today. Yet Pascal's wager remains instructive in this one respect. One still has to choose. In Pascal's formulation, the risk was so one-sided that it barely existed at all. Today, the risk appears palpable. Finding principles and a foundation for one's spirituality then cannot escape the risk of choice the risk of commitment. No storm-free zone exists or offers refuge for those who would actively participate in today's world. One must choose because not to choose is to choose. Assuming responsibility for the center of gravity of one's life appears important a decision too important a decision to be left entirely to the whim of private logic or private experience. The individual's need, the individual needs public options and stories to have any chance of finding real principles and anything like a foundation. A responsible sorting out and protection of the deepest dimension of one's freedom requires some sort of community or social ratification, a purely idiosyncratic spirituality that makes no appeal to genuinely, generally reasonable principles and a public story hardly appears responsible. It's a choice, but it's not a responsible choice. One has to choose, and one has to choose responsibly. So that's the first, uh, in search of a principle and a foundation, and in a way, uh, at least the beginnings of a, f of a foundation are seen in a self-conception of the human that uh, it seems could be accepted by many. I move now to Jesus as leader. It gets a little more pro problematic here. <clears throat> This consideration pro provides the keystone of the structure of Ignatius' spiritual exercises. It sets up the essential logic of the spirituality that he's proffering in these exercises. It's a spirituality which chooses Jesus of Nazareth as its focal point because that's the focal point of Christian faith. On the surface, the metaphor on which Ignatius builds the meditation compares Jesus' call for followers to the invitation or summons of a king to a cause so noble that no one of goodwill could possibly refuse it. The reflection that follows probes the deeper structure of this human experience that allows the meditation 
to open up a searching perspective on the entire gospel story. That's what Ignatius meant to do with it. It's a lead-in to the stories, to contemplating the stories of Jesus through his whole public ministry, death and resurrection. Um, so Jesus appears as the place to look and provides an option for meaning in existence, in, 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 uh, in uh, human life. So let me begin. The only place to find transcendence is in the world. Jesus of Nazareth or some other place. Human beings have no direct access to ultimate reality. Although what Christians call God sustains reality itself by, be, by a creating presence, human beings have no access to ultimate reality directly or apart from the world in which they exist. Because they are tied to history, because they have bodies, because religious experience passes through particular persons, things, events, that focus attention and provide content and meaning, you cannot escape history. In their turn, revelatory symbols like theophanies and prophets or sacred objects and places draw the consciousness of those who encounter them into a sphere of transcendent mystery that offers meaning and liberating power. Revelatory experience in its founding form or within a tradition in its continuing form is described in many different ways. There are so many different conceptions of it as enlightenment, as gift, as existential encounter, as personal communication, as salvation, as liberation. Different images name the character of what is experienced across the spectrum that stretches from sheer emptiness to a fullness of being. Because revelation always has some mediating focus, some place where uh, the ultimate uh, is communicated through it, one can approach a particular tradition of rev revelation through its central medium, whether it be the Quran or whether it be the Jewish scriptures, or whether it be the Buddha or Jesus of Nazareth. So one can approach what's going on in this revelation through the symbol uh, or the lens uh, that one allows to fill his or her consciousness with grace, with meaning and empowerment. The experience of transcendence that occurs through particular historical symbols possesses a tensive character. The tension lies between the particular revelatory symbol and the transcendent reality that it makes present to those who encounter it. Revelation carries this tension and spiritual consciousness shares in its dynamic character. For example, the fleeting beauty of a daffodil or a vast field of them in morning sunlight can evoke a sense of, trans of a transcendent source of beauty that repeats itself in individual units year after year across time. Transcendent values such as justice or the dignity of an integral human person elicit a spontaneous repugnance against criminal, manifest criminal injustice and sympathy for any individual who suffers from a debilitating injury of which he or she is innocent. Negative experience especially can be powerfully revelatory of transcendence. For example, innocent suffering and dehumanizing events or situations spontaneously stimulate reactions on the basis of transcendent convictions of the way things should be, although they are not. The absoluteness of the conviction reveals the transcendence. These different kinds of experience draw human consciousness into a sphere of meaning both below and above 
the surface and operational uh, uh, surface of things. In negative experiences, human beings can encounter a transcendent ground for better possibilities. In ecstatic experiences, human beings can encounter a transcendent invitation to hope. These experiences open up a sphere of value, responsibility, morality, and still more deeply, the sphere of spirituality and a response to something that bears a claim on being itself, on one's person. Religious symbols draw human response down into created reality more deeply, where the question of the reasons for being and being at all may be considered. Only within that region can one discover the height and the breadth of an inner possibility for a fullness of being that can serve as a ground for hope. This is transcendent reality. So this provides a kind of background for moving into how Jesus can function for a seeker, for one who is looking for this kind of experience. Jesus lies at the core of Christian spirituality. It's the centering focus by which we identify who and what God is. So the pivotal character of this meditation by Ignatius then <coughs> lies in the way that Ignatius introduces Jesus into a quest for transcendence and following uh, something that's leading us forward. Now Ignatius presents Jesus on the model of a king and that simply does not work today. Jesus of Nazareth was not a king. Compar comparing him to a king represents a personal and a cultural appropriation of Jesus by Ignatius into his own life. It made perfect sense to him. Generally, the literal imagery of a king leading a military crusade is repugnant today. Crusades are typically referenced to suggest moral failure and cultural relativism. The military leader does not invite a positive construal of Jesus' ministry. Jesus also excuse me, Ignatius also presents Jesus as a leader who appears, appeals to human freedom with a transcendent cause. There's the key of Ignatius' uh, spiritual exercises. The king in the story models Jesus by pro proposing a project, a cause that elicits a course of action. Jesus of Nazareth reveals the cause of God, not simply by who he is, but prior to that, by what he says and what he does, Jesus by what he proposes for human action in his parables and in his own actions. For the seeker, God is not known. God is precisely the unknown. What Jesus holds forth is not God, but God's intentions and project for the world. The meaning of the proposal that Jesus is a parable of God refers to the story of Jesus to the series of his sayings and doings. What, behi what lies behind all the doctrines about Jesus are the events of Jesus, the stories, and the story of Jesus, which each gospel tries to capture in its own way. Nothing, no doctrine, not even ritual language, not even ritual behavior, communicate Jesus of Nazareth better and more forcefully to the human imagination and human consciousness than the stories that tell what he means by telling what he said and what he did and how that can affect people. Jesus' actions reveal what God is like. One could summarize the intention behind the narrative of Jesus as human flourishing. 
All Jesus' sayings refer to an ultimate reality that supports human life and its development to the full human potential that it is capable. All Jesus' actions are oriented to making what he calls the values and the will of God actual in his concrete ministry. This is where the model of a crusading king particularly fails today. The idea of, uh, the idea of conquering, of victory by force, compromises the very end or purpose of Jesus' ministry, which is to promote freedom. The ministry of Jesus responds to such questions as these. Where does the ultimate meaning of human existence lie? What is its source or ground? Where, where and how does it manifest itself? In the project that he proposes. The response to these questions, of course, behind it has God. But Jesus does not just say God is like this or that. God is the unknown. We don't know God. Rather, Jesus himself is the response. So that by, when one looks at Jesus, one says to oneself, God is like Jesus. Jesus reveals the character of ultimate reality. By embodying the action or the intention of ultimate reality, God in his ministry. This is mediating a power for full human flourishing in, in, in our world today. So Jesus' actions provide a template for complete human freedom. Finally, Ignatius proposes the story of Christ the King as a summons or an invitation to enter into this sphere of meaning and action. It's a summons. It's an invitation. The reason why narrative or story must accurately, most accurately uh, represents Jesus of Nazareth as it does any human life act, actually lies in its moral and religious appeal. The gospel stories provide the best way to combine his moral and religious call together. The gospel stories represent Jesus as dedicated to the cause which he called the reign of God. The moral objective represents God's desires and simultaneously possesses an intrinsically religious dimension because it's sacred. This religiously moral cause thus makes an appeal to the sensibilities of all human beings. Jesus is an invitation to a new experience and exercise of life. But this can only be participated in, and this is crucial, it can only be participated in by choosing it and acting it out. It's existential. You can't say notionally, that's, oh, that's right. You've got to do it. This analytic meditation sends one back to the stories of Jesus with a formula that allows them to shed light on the basic questions of human existence and the drama of each one's personal story. Each story about Jesus presents him as an icon that releases basic meaning about ultimate reality and human existence simultaneously. Thus, each story reveals another facet of the character of ultimate reality, of God, on the premise that God is like Jesus, that Jesus represents and reveals the creator God, each story and the whole story are invitations to choose and participate in the cause of creating the meaning that one is seeking. Finding God in all things, the last uh, uh, se section. <clears throat> The last 
exercise of Ignatius's spiritual exercises is called contemplation to attain love. It can be and has been described as containing a creation mysticism because in it Ignatius proposes that one find God suffusing all of creation and more specifically acting in creation for one's own personal benefit. The first consideration of the exercises seeking principles and a foundation also considered creation in terms that sought for principles upon which one could find uh, coherence and internal meaning in human existence. Ignatius returns then at the end to creation and now filled with enthusiasm, with the meaning that he has found in the story of Jesus. In the light of the narrative of Jesus of Nazareth, Ignatius finds God in all things. So let me unpack that idea in uh, stages. Our creation spirituality is transformed in the context of a personal God revealed by Jesus. The first principle of creation in the light of the story of Jesus is that the creator is personal. God, the infinite and sustaining ground of the universe, should not be conceived as a distinct and limited person, a person, but God is personal nonetheless. Because God is personal, the first principle of spirituality coalesces in gratitude. An evangelical shift occurs within the theology of creation leading to a new foundation for Christian spirituality, gratitude. Luther and Ignatius, in this contemplation, both propose a transformed interpersonal context for understanding creation. The new context does not deny or oppose a metaphysical view, but it draws cosmic teleology and cosmic language, the first cause and so on. It draws that cosmic language into a new framework of personalism. In our day, the scientific story of creation provides the concrete data. It is large, it is awesome. But in the light of G the Jesus story, this is transformed and reappropriated in a personalist way. Creation and existence become personal gifts that call for gratitude. Ignatius's formula of the logic of gratitude, one of the keys to the contemplation, is found in the second prelude uh, of the meditation. It's in your notes there. <clears throat> the second pre prelude in the three things that one is seeking. One is looking for interior knowledge of all the great good that I have received so that I may be stirred to profound gratitude so that this in turn will enable me to love and serve God's divine majesty in all things. The three dimensions together form one positive experience of gratitude for God's love that embraces me in particular so that I spontaneously respond out of gratitude and in mutual love. The whole exercise rides on the personal experience of being accepted and affirmed by God, referred to by Luther as the freedom of the Christian, liberated from any internal bondage because accepted by the principle of all reality God. God's love for me supports freedom and enables a response of gratitude that overflows in love of neighbor. The first of the three components launches the experience. Ignatius underlines it in the first line of the first point. I will call back into memory the gifts I have received. 
my creation, my redemption, and the other gifts particular to myself. These gifts are particular to each one. They define the identity of each person. This contemplation then is cosmic in its scope, but utterly and absolutely particular and personal in its application. The horizon of this spirituality <clears throat> is defined by the reasons for gratitude. Ignatius points to four specific ways in which this positive experience of gratitude and response can be awakened in four aspects of God as the personal ground of being. These are the four points of the meditation. In the first, God is giving, God is gifting. In the second, God is present to all cre creation as a personal present, immediately present to. In the third, God is active as spirit, not dormant, but energy. In the fourth, God appears as the source of all good found in creation. Contemplating these four points constitutes the mysticism. It becomes mystical not when one applies a doctrine of creation to the world. It's mysticism because God is found within the world and in contemplating the world. In other words, it's the mysticism that's the basis of the doctrine, not the doctrine of the basis of the mysticism. <coughs> The substance of this spiritual spirituality consists in action, motivated by the fundamental spiritual attitude of gratitude. What Ignatius is aiming at here might be called a fundamental attitude, a basic disposition of the person, of the whole person, a durable, inclusive value response that's always active, a mindset or a habitual or pervasive outlook that governs one's activity even when it's not being explicitly called up and uh, acting as a motivation. It's at work. One can think of various examples of human relationships or commitments to an ideal that commands such loyalty that they pervade the whole person. Concern for the inclusive object becomes one's characteristic disposition governing all one's activities and implicitly functions as a critic or norm of a person's individual choices and actions. So it becomes a moral norm as well. When this foundational attitude of gratitude to God has been nourished and built up, it will tend spontaneously to be actualized in one's everyday activity, all the time. This can be explicitly formulated from time to time, as in the prayer that all one's actions spring from God, be carried forward by the help of God's inward spirit, and be brought to an effective conclusion that represents God's values in the world. So let me conclude very, very briefly. <clears throat> this searching interpretation of Ignatius's spiritual exercises roots spirituality within the story of creation. I did not dwell on that, but that's a very powerful motive behind this. It places that story, however, within the context of a cosmic personalism mediated by the story of Jesus, so that Jesus becomes the bigger horizon within which creation spirituality is set. This spirituality consists in radical commitment to this world and the people in it on the conviction that the very actions that carry out that dedication are responses of love to the creator God who is a God of love, and who is the within of all things. Amen. Thank you, Roger, very much for um, a mind-expanding, even a 
mind blowing um, <laughs> interpretation of Ignatius, the exercise of spirituality, really the human quest. Um, and it might take us uh, a few minutes to contemplate this, to even begin to respond and ask questions or make comments. But um, so we can have a moment or two of silence. It's okay. Um, and then Roger will uh, address questions and also um, observations uh, about this as he sees this, I think, as, a, as he said at the beginning, a learning exchange that goes both ways. Um, and the conversation is an important part of the lecture uh, as well. So Roger, you'll, you'll call on people individually and there's Somebody's going to be the mic man uh, so that we can actually all hear your comments and questions and Roger won't be straining to hear or repeat them. So take a minute and be like a Quaker meeting when you're uh, ready to speak. Please do. Speak or ask or seek. <laughs> Judy. Get your, get your mic a little bit more. Okay. Okay, well, first, yeah, if I may. Okay. Um, so, am I correct in concluding that, is it on? Um, concluding that um, at the end of these exercises, the seekers will have found a God as opposed to no God? Uh, at the end of the <clears throat> eight weeks of uh, daily prayer that students did for eight weeks. Uh, I asked them to uh, write a thousand word uh, evaluation or journal uh, uh, statement of what happened during it. But I also asked them for one liners or one sentence. What did you get out of this retreat? And. Uh, we spent a whole class just listening to them. No two were alike. No two were alike. Um, in other words, this isn't programmed. Uh, and Ignatius is very, very strong on that. The, the nation, the, they have a structure and people write on the logic of the exercises and there are different interpretations of the logic. That is some sort of ideal pattern uh, which is First of all, very autobiographical, and then secondly, uh, it tails off. Uh, uh, but the, uh, uh, the, f the front end of the exercises are quite, quite seriously programmed towards uh, making a decision in life. Um, that all having been said, the fundamental principle is get out of the way of the spirit, uh, and the spirit is the name of whatever a person is experienced that in within his or her life that's positive and constructive. Uh, so the answer to that question is, I don't expect anything, and students shouldn't expect, uh, uh, maker, uh, makers shouldn't expect anything of, of this. Uh, this should be fulfilled with surprises. But then again, people wouldn't be there if they weren't looking for something. So, so th all of that factors in. But it's not programmed in, in the sense of an expected outcome, and it's certainly not. Uh, it's certainly not uh, uh, drawing people into a theistic position. It's not meant to do that. This is part of this tension. You can't very well talk about Jesus without mentioning God. I mean, you kind of can't do that. So. So this this is the tension, and and as I said, uh, some seekers will say, yeah, it was great, and until you went over some sort of threshold where I, I can't go there. But Jesus, he was pointing. He said something to me. That's what I want, and that's what I think Ignatius can give, precisely because the. Uh, the exercises are structured around Jesus' humanity. He's uh, presented as a leader, and therefore he's looking for followers. And, and, and so everything fits into that grid.
Oh, we may never get there. <laughs> Brian. Go Mm. It did not come up, but I would be very, very surprised if it wasn't operati operative in some in some people's uh, cases. Yeah, I know that I've had friends who are twelve-step people, and that becomes a very, very powerful, deep spirituality in their lives, and and everything else is almost adjunct to that, and it can be fruitfully adjunct to to it, but it's adjunct to it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A good piece on that. Yeah. Published about 13 years ago. Yeah. And and Judy's here. I'm curious. <coughs> Curious about the uh, mechanics of the retreat. Did you give a, you know, points every week? Uh, were th the mechanics, yeah, I can explain that very, very uh, briefly. I only met with students 50 minutes a week. Uh, two weeks to set up. Who was Ignatius? What did he do for a living? These are his exercises, key concepts, and stuff like that. And then I set up. Uh, over eight weeks, I set up five uh, meditations with two repetitions uh, for uh, each day, and I asked students for 20 to 25 minutes of uh, prayer or meditation or uh, whatever they would do, however they would use that for every day, and insisted mainly on consistency, that is to say, doing it at the same time all the time. In other words, a certain discipline of doing it, which is which is which is uh, uh, not unheard heard of uh, uh, at Union because there's a Buddhist meditation class that gets up at six and and meditates for an hour and that's required every day for uh, so uh, so uh, I wasn't asking for much compared to <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let me see if I have anything to add to that. Um, Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I had an assistant who was a graduate of Union. She had been a Catholic. She had been a religious woman. She had went to Union. She became Presbyterian. She's ordained Presbyterian. She's always had a love of the exercises. So she knows the Protestant. She's a pastor over in New Jersey. Uh, uh, and uh, so she, she did spiritual direction, and she did uh, dealing with students for ca d direction and counseling and so on. I wouldn't have done it without that. I mean, in other words, I could not. Uh, they are very strong on boundaries at, at Union, and to be a professor and to be uh, a spiritual director is not, is not uh, you can't do that. Uh, so this worked out perfectly, uh, and she's, she's also uh, done the, the graduates retreat uh, uh, so sh it's, a, it's, it's been a perfect arrangement, and she'll be back again in the spring when I do it again. I'm curious about uh, the comments you made in the first section about um, seeking principles and foundation that human existence is freedom and what nurtures freedom in self and, and in others is good. Um, did you get any sense of, of how the students reflected or understood that sense of freedom um, in terms of, I guess, what we would call authentic freedom versus the contemporary sense of whatever is good for me? Um, would students get that or would they use I the think exercises so. yeah. let me, to... Let me answer yeah. that, uh, Judy, in two parts. First of all, <coughs> I use the, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the term freedom 
as, practically speaking, synonymous with spirit. So uh, freedom, it, when it applies to the human, does not just mean the ability to choose this or that or something like that. It refers to the inner character of being conscious and not only knowing, but knowing that you're knowing and being self-conscious and having a kind of uh, control over your actions in some measure. I mean, I'm, I don't want to exaggerate this, but I do want to insist on it, that the human is distinctive in this regard. Uh, not utterly distinctive because we correlate very cleanly with with other forms of life, but at the same time, this freedom refers to something very deeply uh, elemental. So that's kind of a basic anthropological concept, so that the flourishing of freedom is the flourishing of human existence, namely the freedom being the defining characteristic of what it means to be a human. So I'm using it a very, very, uh, 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 basic or fundamental or foundational sense. But at the same time, in the exercise of freedom, I turn to Søren Kierkegaard and, and refer to different levels of freedom. One is choosing, and one is paradoxically, Kierkegaard says, a much higher form of freedom where you commit to something, which on the outside, to the aesthete, appears like you're locking yourself in. But if freedom is uh, a self-disposition and taking oneself into one's own hands, then commitment to a higher value and sticking to it is a higher form of freedom than following your nose, choosing this, oh no, choosing, you know, going from pleasure to pleasure, the, the butterfly or something like that. So it's a different level of freedom. And faith, I think, is still a higher level of freedom where one turns to uh, ultimacy and uh, allows the object of one's freedom because that to which we commit ourselves is very self-defining. And so to commit oneself to a cause that is transcendent in its character is a still higher form of freedom. And students get that. They get that. Uh, by definition, a union student is a seeker, practically speaking, if you were to define them. That's why they're there. That's why they're not in their denominational seminaries. And even when they're there for more pragmatic concerns, like getting a first degree so they can apply for PhD programs, or just getting a general education with values in a very pragmatic sense, because there are some of those too. Still, they're very deep and they're committed students. Uh, and so it's safe to say that, that they get those levels of, fr of freedom. They get those. And they can turn them uh, inwardly into reflection and Give and give them a meditative character. I mean, they're not just that. That's not just facts. This is understanding your very self, and they they can appreciate it at that level. Yes, Judy and then David. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Um, you talked about the students having the opportunity to write uh, an essay or one-liners. Engaging the fruits of this experience, you know, in the Ignatian um, way of the more, or do you have a sense that for the students it does inspire their desires for either continuing daily prayer, seeking spiritual direction? Um, uh, you know, it's, exercises aren't stagnant, that, you know, it's always a leaping off point. Um, can you comment on what your, um, the responses of the students or how you might gauge the fruits of this? Yeah, that I can't. I cannot. I, I know that they are moved by them and that they, are, they have a, a, a effects in their lives, but how those play out, I don't know. They're memorable. They, 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 they're memorable. Uh, and so they point to them as uh, an experience that they went through that was 
that had an impact. But exactly what that happened, I didn't do a follow-up, you know, a year later, weeks later, and so on. I ended, uh, w when it ended, I ended with, I didn't follow it up. But occasionally you get feedback, and with some of the evaluative papers, you could see that people were really into it. And uh, as I say, no two people are, were alike. They're all very, very different. Thanks. If there was a pattern that I noticed, it came from students whose tradition of prayer seemed to have seemed to be or have been uh, reading official prayers, either in a service, a worship service, or a Eucharistic service, or a, 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 a worship service on Sunday, uh, where the minister prays, or where the congregation prays, or where they sing. But you see, you're using the text, and the text is an objective medium. It's putting the words into your mouth. Mm -hmm. So what, 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 what they found interesting is what Ignatius calls a colloquy. Those who are fil f familiar with the exercises, he, he asks for a personal conversation, interior conversation with God. Uh, that kind of turning to the self. Now let's talk about the denominational students, the students who are, who are Christians and from the various denominations. Finding God within and not the transcendent one and not reach through prayer but simply turning within and finding God utterly accessible in one's very self was new to a lot of students. David. Thank you so much for this, uh, I think, very moving and illuminating reflection on both the seeker, but also, I think, on revealing some very important aspects of the spiritual exercises mm -hmm. and how they can touch people's lives, uh, whether they're Christians or seekers or mm -hmm. whatever, however you want to see it. Um, I have a question for you, though, in terms of, 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 of sort of the phenomenology of what's going on in the spiritual exercises. You've done a very interesting job, I think, in highlighting key aspects of the principle and foundation, the call of the king and the contemplation to obtain love that you went through. Um, and I took it, the attainment of a certain freedom, the movement toward a certain commitment, and then a movement toward gratitude were the three mm -hmm. sort of emphases that you brought to the fore. Let me ask this, not so much in the principle and foundation, but in the call of the king and in the contemplation to obtain love, as well as in a number of other parts of the spiritual exercises, not only commitment and gratitude, but love as the response from the person making the spiritual exercises seems to me to be a very important uh, outcome, if you will, of the meditations or the reflections. Love for God, mm -hmm. love for Jesus, and so forth. Now that, that may be in tension, as you pointed, with some aspects of, of, the, uh, of the seeker dimension that mm -hmm. you're talking about. But on the other hand, the commitment part, or the decision part that you're calling for, or that you're indicating can occur for a seeker, strikes me would be motivated by an awakened love of some mm -hmm. kind that would come upon one. And I'm just trying to get a little handle on, on some of the dynamics of these meditations that you're pointing to. And I wonder if this response in love as a different mode of reflecting on what some of the meditations might lead toward, make possible, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that would sort of give a different tilt to the sort of language that you used about freedom, gratitude, freedom, commitment, and gratitude. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that, I'm not trying to disagree with anything you've said. I'm really more trying to sort of add on a piece of it and ask whether it makes sense in light of the work that you're doing on yeah. this. I, I mean, I don't know how to, uh, to uh, answer the question, except that I'm very, very aware of the, uh, 
the dimension that you point out in Ignatius, it's Ignatius for the Christian wants the retreatant to follow Jesus not because what Jesus uh, says makes sense, but because he's in love with Jesus. It's very, very clear, and it gets it gets stronger and stronger, and uh, and where it becomes very, very strong is in uh, the third and the fourth week, um, where Christian theology has taken Jesus's death and piled on so much interpretation and atonement theory and redemption theory and sacrifice theory and it's loaded, it's loaded, and resurrection story is loaded with theology and so on. None of it is in Ignatius. It's just not there. All he has is, look at Jesus, he's suffering. Aren't you broken too? In other words, it's an affective relationship with Jesus that should so move you that you will want to follow him all the more closely, will steal your conviction. So it's, it's almost atheological, it's so affective. Ignatius the soldier was a weeper. He, he was a man of great affections and, and so on. Uh, so I've presented this as, as quite rational and analytical and so on. But I'm, I'm, I'm not recreating Ignatius on the, in, that, in, that, in that measure. I point in the other reflections, I point that out. I mean, you can't not point it out when you see the three classes of humility or the three degrees of humility or being humble, however you translate it. Uh, because that's the whole point of that meditation. And so you can't sort of hide it. But what people will do with it, depending on where they are, is, I, you know, there's no answer to that because you have to say, well, this person, or this person, or this person, or this person, you know, is a person uh, uh, Buddhist in their orientation so that the word God doesn't make much sense, but ultimate reality they might be able to live with or, f or uh, uh, ultimacy they might be able to with li live with because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's undifferentiated. It's, it's just uh, this open, vague word. Uh, so, I mean, I had a couple of Buddhists who were making these exercises. What, what were they doing, doing with uh, personal love of God? Uh, if it, it's not there. They understood what Ignatius was talking about because he was a Christian, but I'm not a Christian. So it, it, there, it's very Jesus-centered, and uh, I don't hide the fact that Ignatius wants the retreatant to be affectively united with Jesus, but I do present it in a much more a objective kind of way, but leaving open those who move in that direction. It's like the conversion question, the first one. Maybe people will, s will start moving in that direction. It's possible, yeah, but I mean, that's, that's not the point. It's, the point is to say that Jesus is universally relevant. And uh, if you're a seeker, you can't do it by yourself. You've got to look for some public models. And here's one. Take a look. If I was a Buddhist, I'd be doing something else. You know, I'd be, there'd be another model. Yeah, Tom. Tom. You mentioned the, uh, the inner dynamic that's within us as a human being, that the spirit is at work. And if you're going to spend 20 minutes a day and pray about the gospel, you mentioned the uh, surprising things that are going to happen. Now, I'm assuming that some surprising things happened in those Buddhist practitioners. Anything like that seems to me, it's, if it's a surprise, it's coming to us. I'm wondering how they thought of that. Like, where is it coming from? And, and do they have gratitude? from the source, mm. if that gave them a new way of looking at ultimate reality. Mm. Yeah, the people who are Buddhists um, were in these, <coughs> this, the exercises another way around. They've been around the corner a few times. 
you know, obviously they're Buddhists, and now they're trying this one out, and they've tried a few others, centering prayer, and they've tried this, you know, let's see what, so they, they, they know how to talk about things objectively, so that you didn't get the kind of level of sharing that, 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 that uh, is the implicit referent of your, of your question, you know, what was happening in their interior life when they were meditating on this. Now, when they talked about what they got out of it, they said, well, this is very interesting because he does this and he does that. Now, I hear they were quite objective about it. So what was going on interiorly, I, I just don't know. And that would be another conversation. It would be a deep conversation, probably that they would have with the spiritual director rather than, than with myself as the presenter. At the back there, and then Anne-Marie. I'm making you go. I'm, I'm, ask, I'm sending you around the room. You're going to get a lot of exercise. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> What I find very impressive about St. Ignatius is that he practices what he preaches. And I'm trying to apply that to Catholic education today. I understand St. Ignatius, he, he insisted that no tuition fees be charged to the students because he wanted to make it equal. He wanted to make sure the poor had a chance. Now, today, uh, granted, the Catholic Church has come pretty close to it. I mean, I went to public uh, to Catholic grammar school and high school and the parish paid and the Knights of Columbus paid for my first year of college, but look at the tuitions today. Would St. Ignatius stand for that? In our <laughs> and should we? No. I think you, you, your, your question is more of a statement than a question. <laughs> Anne-Marie. Um, Roger, I just wanted to get a little bit more clarification on who seekers are. You said it's something that's inclusive, and you did talk about people who feel unsettled in their denomination. Can people who are settled in their denomination also be seekers, and how might this be of help? Yeah, I always like the uh, uh, gospel story of the, uh, that ends with the line, uh, I believe, help my unbelief. That's a very, very good phrase because it's got a dialectic or, or tension built right into it. And I think uh, given the times that we live, I won't do a phenomenology of that because you're all aware of the distractions and so on. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the statistics. The statistics are dire. Uh, more in the mainline denomination though than in Catholicism, but we're, we're not far behind. Uh, the, the, stati the statistics are dire of uh, people uh, abandoning the churches. Um, so, um, yeah, I think I, th I think that there's a seeker in all of us, and and in a way, I have to confess that uh, taking the seeker as the explicit audience is is a way also of addressing the seeker in all of us. And it's to force uh, the imagination back to uh, the essentials and to the really real of our ca ca Christian faith. Karl Rahner has this image, and I cannot find it. If uh, Richard Lenan was here, maybe he could tell me where it is. But he compares the development of Catholic uh, doctrine to the tree, the trunk of the tree, the branches, bigger branches, more branches, <laughs> leaves, more leaves and leaves and so on. So pretty, for sure, pretty soon you're hanging on to the leaves and the trunk of the tree is neglected. So I want to I, I, I use spirituality as a l leverage because spirituality is the very, very basis of doctrine and not the other way around, to get to back to the essentials and the radical essential of things. So I think in so doing, um, what I am hoping is that this approach that addresses the seeker will also find an audience in the most stable of uh, uh, Christians in the denominations who are, who are very, very content, but this will force them to go more deeply into their very commitment and so on. 
So there is a uh, there is a uh, subtext to the to to this, and it's to address the seeker in all of us. I th yeah. um, the way you present this makes uh, freedom kind of an end of of the exercises, whereas I think for my my thought is always that Ignatius has it kind of as a means. Is is what you're saying that? If one can become more free, you somehow and discover an end. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, why, why, why not eschatology uh, as complete freedom? Complete freedom within the Creator. It's freedom as I defined it in this question earlier, not sort of. Uh, uh, f f freedom of being able to choose this or that, or whim, or fancy, or so on. It's a, it's a very, very deep concept of freedom. Okay, I think maybe this will be the last question. Use the mic so that... Sure. Uh, I said, would you would you think that the response of the students and the success of this is because you're approaching this um, in a non-theistic? When I say that, you you you're really it seems like you're focusing on the person of Jesus and encouraging the um, the student to find that God within, rather than in a theistic kind of way. Uh, okay, but you're a little bit too strong with my motivations there. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to use the exercises. I'm, not, I'm trying to be faithful to them and allow right. them to speak to another audience. One of the things that Ignatius did insist on uh, is that these exercises are infinitely, infinitely adaptable. They can be given to anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere, in any manner. Uh, so, but if they're them, that is to say, if they're a spiritual exercise, you have to be faithful to them in adapting them. So I'm trying to work within the confines of them. I'm not using them as a tool to manipulate them to get where I want them. Uh, but I am giving an accent to them by imagining an audience who is approaching Jesus without a Christian background and, and so on. Uh, most of the people in the, in the room did have and do have Christian backgrounds, and they're in a Christian seminary, so there's Jesus language all over the place. The Unitarians say, oh, more Jesus language. Yeah, well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a school of Christian theology. That's why that's what you're trying to get it, but they, they live with that. But you are approaching it more from, from the um, human Jesus. Am I right? In of course, that, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think that's that may have been what I meant by yeah, that. Yeah. You know that so that they meet the human Jesus and and in that way they can identify clearly with exactly with that and mm. then be aware that that God is within them. That's right. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.